the waveguide, the, the taper waveguide you, you design here. And therefore, if you want to achieve a good coupling efficiency, you have to kind of uh, carefully simulate and design your taper coupler. Now, if you design with a wrong, if you have a wrong design, your coupling efficiency is something like 1% or, let's say, even less than 1%. But if you design it carefully, that you can achieve even 50% coupling efficiency. So actually, the performance actually can increase uh, crucially. And you know, if you work with silicon photonics or if you work with a uh, 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 nanofabrication device, and the power budget is always the central topic that you need to concern about, especially if you want to kind of, say, promote your, your, uh, your, your result to, to industry, then you have to always show that uh, it's kind of a, a power if, uh, budget efficient. So that's why this kind of um, um, coupling is actually, uh, when you design your, your, your device, and you, you start to do your experiment, you have to first think about uh, how to couple your light into your chip uh, efficiently. So before I, uh, I go to the, the physics model, let, let's, let me first give you an introduction of, of this, uh, the, the method we're using, the FDTD. So, so far that the, in this workshop, you learn uh, COMSO, you learn ANSYS, and they're they all based on finite element method. Okay, and the, basically you solve the Maxwell equation in the frequency domain. Now, FDTD is different, actually. You solve the, the problem in the, in the time domain. And then, uh, basically, it's basically just uh, simulate the, 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 the light, the electromagnetic wave propagated in the, in the real device, like, uh, like watching a movie. That's why FDTD is, very intuit is, is more intuitive than, than FEM. Now, here is actually a, a short summary of FTD, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, which I kind of take from Wikipedia, which I find is it's well summarized. So FTD, it's finite difference time domain or ES method, is a, a kind of numerical analysis technique used for computational electrodynamics. So basically, it's, it's used to, to solve Maxwell equation in a, in a finite uh, uh, space. Now, this is a time domain method. So FTD can, can cover a wide frequency range with a single simulation run and treat the nonlinear material property in a natural way. And this is something that you didn't get from COMSO or, or ANSYS, or maybe you can do it, but the, it's, the, 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 it's, it's going to be very painful. The, the reason is that, okay, if you, if you, every time you run COMSO or do an ANSYS, basically you set the frequency. So if you want to change the frequency, you restart a new simulation. So if you want to uh, simulate kind of the, the device for a broadband, a broadband source, then depending on how many frequency you want to, to measure, and you have to run kind of uh, the same number of simulations. But the FTD is different. If you want to, let's say, if I want to test my, my, uh, the, the device performance at, uh, at one micro uh, wavelength or two micro wavelengths, what I need to do is actually just to launch a broadband source, which covers from one micron to two micro. And then I just launch one simulation and just uh, extract, extract the, the result at this specific wavelength, and then I get the other, other kind of result at different wavelengths in a single, uh, single uh, simulation run. And also, since it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a broadband, then you can actually consider the nonlinear effect, for example, the frequency doubly and, uh, and uh, some frequency generation and, uh, and difference frequency generation. This is, uh, is not uh, very easy to, to achieve with, uh, with uh, COMSO and the ANSYS. So the FTTD method belongs to the general class of grid-based uh, differential numerical modeling method, which got the and different methods. So grid-based, it means that actually you kind of uh, have a, a time sequence. Each time, you have a time step, delta t, OK? So at the each uh, time step, you solve the Maxwell equation. You get an E-field based on, the, based on the knowledge on the, on, of, the, of the magnetic field. And then you solve the magnetic field based on your E-field and then you move to the next time step. So it's really kind of a step by step. Like, like you watch in the movie, you see the kind of, uh, say that's how this is kind of movie. And, um, and the time dependent, yeah, so basically it solved the time dependent Maxwell equation in a partial differential form and okay, disc discretized in the same space and time domain. And there you just uh, solve the electric vector component in your volume space and with uh, uh, instant time and then the magnetic field. And then you move to the next time step. So in a, in a kind of a nutshell, that actually this is actually the uh, algorithm of FDTD. So basically, you have an initial condition, and then you put into here. 
So basically, you have to set a condition for uh, for your for your simulation. Either you say I set a certain kind of time step, I give a certain simulation time, or you say uh, I give a threshold of the system. So I want to know. Uh, I, I, let's say I, if the, the the field distribution in this system uh, is almost uh, kind of below a threshold, so it's uh, stable, then I stop the simulation, or I give a simulation time uh, such that uh, the simulation time passed and uh, I stop the the simulation. So this is you have to give a termination condition, and then in in this loop actually, basically just solve the the electric field and the magnetic field, and then kind of uh, doing this uh, time step until the the simulation time. Uh, uh, collapse, or you kind of uh, reach a certain kind of uh, 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 finish uh, termination condition. So, uh, if you want to have a look of this, uh, the, 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 the full details of the algorithm, you, you, you suggest to, uh, recommend it to 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 read this pay, uh, this book. Actually, it's um, uh, written by uh, I think it's Alan Tuffluff. So, so it's actually a well well written book, and it's, it's qu quite thick. So you can basically know how it works. But nowadays, basically, there's a lot of uh, Lumic or commercial software. So you don't have to write uh, uh, the, the MATLAB code to, to, to simulate your structure. In old days, this is exactly what people are doing. So in, that, in this book, actually, there's a lot of uh, programming skills. And uh, thanks to the development of technology, nowadays, we, we just use some commercial software. Like the software I'm using now is, uh, is from Lumic. And you can just you just need to know the physics and know how the how these models uh, how how this uh, algorithm works and you can quickly set up your model and get your 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 result quickly. Now the the FTD also have certain kind of drawbacks. The first is the dispersion handling. So because you set a different time step, right? And and actually because the wavelengths, uh, if you simulate a broadband wavelength, then actually. The smaller wavelengths and the, and the la uh, larger, longer wavelengths actually they, ha they have different grid because your grid, your mesh is based on the wavelengths. Therefore, equivalently in the in the method, your your sh short wavelengths and the longer wavelengths they propagate at a different speed. And this is to give you kind of numerical dispersion, which is kind of an artifact of the model. This is an artificial uh, di uh, dispersion. And uh, this kind of uh, uh, numerical dispersion sometimes can destroy your, your, your model, such that your, your model is not a diverge. It goes to, uh, it's not a uh, converge, it's diverge. And so numerical dis dispersion handling is very, um, it's very kind of difficult. It's kind of always the central topic of FDTD, especially if you want to uh, really simulate a broadband source. Then you will find actually most of the time uh, your, 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 uh, your model doesn't work because of the the numerical dispersion, which diverge your, your models. And another drawback is it's very slow, because actually it's, uh, it's really kind of solved step by step. So uh, FTT simulation takes a uh, much longer time compared with SEM. Uh, and uh, uh, the last problem is it's, not a, it's very inefficient for high finesse resonator device. So let's see uh, if you have a micro resonator device with a finesse of, uh, let's say, 1,000. Finesse of 1,000 means that the, the, the light the propagates inside the, inside the resonator 1,000 times until it goes out, right? So which means if you want to simulate your, your structure correctly, uh, you want to know the, the resonance, then your simulation time should be longer than the, than the trap time of your light. So which means that you launch your light and you have to wait your light comes out from the resonator. Therefore, your, your simulation time is, is, is actually a proportional to 1 over SSR. Uh, yeah. No, it's pro yeah, one over, or, or it's, uh, it's proportional to finesse. So, which means if you want to uh, simulate with, uh, with a very high finesse resonator, you want to see the resonance by in injection uh, a broadband source, it, be it can be uh, uh, very inefficient and uh, it takes you a really long time. So, this is some several drawbacks of this uh, software. So, it depends on what you want. So, when you do the simulation, you have to think about what you want. And uh, then you, you have to think about what you have. So basically, do you have uh, enough time? And do you have a very powerful uh, software uh, and a c computer? And then you have to decide whether I use uh, uh, in the FTTD or use FEM. So with FTTD, actually, I can, I can get the broadband source. And I can get the kind of uh, the broadband response of the, uh, of the structure. But I spend more time. With FEM, actually, for each individual frequency, OK, it's very fast. And the, the precision is kind of good. 
but uh, but you have to repeat this kind of simulation one by one if you change your, your frequency. So you have to be careful when you want to, to select the right software. So this is like what people say in the simulation uh, community that, uh, that if you are not careful, you put the junk in, you get the junk out. You didn't learn anything. And uh, it's especially this kind of simulations cost you time and cost you the electricity. So, so be, be, a little, um, be a little careful and uh, try to, kind of, um, to, to, to first uh, understand what you, want, what, what, you want to, uh, what you want to achieve and then properly decide what kind of software you're using and what kind of method. So now uh, let's go to the physics. So basically what we want to do is actually we want to kind of uh, uh, get uh, some light from a lens of fiber into a kind of a photon, uh, it's a ch a w a waveguide. It can be slick nitride, it can be, can be slick, it can be any material. Okay, this lens, what the, this lens of fiber gives you is actually kind of a spatial, uh, tightly focused Gaussian mode. And this Gaussian mode, if you kind of uh, fulfill some good condition, then this light is, a, is able to couple it into this uh, waveguide there, and it allows you to get a very high power I into your chip. And then if you want to do some kind of uh, uh, nonlinear photonics, you get uh, some advantage. So what determines the coupling efficiency here? So the input coupling efficiency is actually determined by the first the effective, uh, effective uh, reflective index mismatch, which is given by the Steele laws. So it tells you that if you couple light from, from air, to silicon dioxide, you get a four percent loss. Okay, if you want to, if you couple your light from from air to silicon nitride, you get ten percent loss. This is actually determines the reflection or transmission at the at the material boundary. And the second is actually what is the most important thing is actually the mode size mismatch. So basically, it's, it tells you that your coupling efficiency is actually the the, the result of uh, of the integral of the input mode and output mode. So it, does, it, it is tells you that if you want to uh, couple the two modes with significant uh, mismatch in the shape, uh, and then you are not, you are not, uh, you're not supposed to get a very good, good coupling efficiency. So actually, this tells you that if you want to get a good coupling efficiency, what you want to do is actually to kind of match the mode from the, uh, match the mode to the, uh, match the uh, kind of couple the mode to your input mode. So what we do here is actually to make a kind of mode converter. That's why we use a kind of a, a, a nano taper here. So about the nano tapers, actually, uh, you probably want to read these two papers, especially this Almeida's paper from Michelle Lipson's group. It's published on Optics Letter, and uh, I think nowadays it's uh, kind of uh, cited by 900 times already. So it's, it's a really well cited paper. And you find actually in this community, a lot of people kind of use this nano uh, taper, uh, this tapered structure. The reason is that actually, if you want to couple some light in, some people use a grating coupler. Grating coupler can get a very good coupling efficiency up to 70%, 80%. But the case is the grating coupler is really dependent on the frequency. So you, if you do nonlinear photonics, okay, you, you couple with CW light, light it's okay. You, you have no problem with the coupling, in, input coupling. But you have some problem with the output coupling. And nano taper usually uh, doesn't have this problem. So it's really kind of a, a broadband uh, uh, mode converter here. Uh, that's why it's, it's kind of widely used. Okay, so now the, now the question is actually uh, how to kind of match the, the, your waveguide mode to, to your input uh, Gaussian mode or fiber mode. What is a very interesting, so let's say if we have a Gaussian mode with a radius of 2.85 micron, actually. When you buy a lens of fiber, you buy an objective, okay, you can measure the, the, the Gaussian mode size of your, of your, of your, uh, if your mode or you can actually read by, by the, uh, you are provided with some information from the manufacturer. So this value actually, you can measure. And then you can actually plot this mode, it looks like this big, okay? And if we have a kind of a waveguide, which have kind of this size, basically uh, in nonlinear photonics, what we want to do is tightly uh, confine the mode, such that uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the core, that we have very high uh, light, uh, light intensity, and this is beneficial, uh, would be beneficial for the for the nonlinear photonics. So if you look at your input Gaussian mode and and my bus uh, my waveguide mode, you find actually the size is actually is quite different. So in principle, if I directly couple this mode and this mode, I'm not going to couple it very well. 
And then, but, the, but the, you can find that actually if you make this uh, kind of waveguide kind of smaller and smaller, <coughs> okay? And you find actually your mode becomes larger and larger. And this is, uh, this is well understood because uh, once your waveguide structure is smaller and your, your evanescent field becomes stronger. And this evanescent field gives you larger mode diameters. And this actually gives us an idea. So this tells you why nanotaper can work very well for the, for the coupling. Because nanotaper, if I, if I remind you here, that actually has a very small tip, okay? Which means that the evanescent field at the input of the table is much, strong, is much, uh, is much uh, stronger than the evanescent field at here. So it means that actually the input mode is actually larger than the output mode. And this is how nanotaper can improve the, the mode match. It kind of improve the coupling efficiency. So for example, in our, kind of, uh, in, in our group, actually, we can make kind of nanotaper in this kind of size. So with this kind of top, uh, top size is about 80 nanometers. And with this setup, we can get a very good uh, coupling efficiency up to 50%. OK, again, this is. OK, so now we want to model this, OK? You probably, you have probably have a different material. You probably have a different uh, wavelength. And now what you want to do is actually you want to find out what is the optimum design for your device. So let's say we launch a Gaussian mode. So in, the, in, the, in this uh, software later I'm going to show you is actually how this model is working. So here actually in the input actually you put a Gaussian mode here like this and you put a normalized power let's say one, okay? And you put your waveguide in this case. It's actually uh, kind of uh, uh, silicon nitride. In my case it's silicon nitride buried in silicon dioxide. But it can be any material, it can be even SOI, this uh, silicon uh, insulator, which also works. It doesn't matter. And, uh, and then you put a kind of taper. Usually you put a taper long enough because you want to have adiabatic operation. So you want to you know, change your mode size adiabatically. Uh, if you do it too quick, that actually you excite the radiation mode, a higher order mode of the bus guy, which you kind of introduce some loss. That's why usually you put kind of long enough uh, uh, distance, which we call uh, to, for the adiabatic operation, okay? Then you want to say, hey, what kind of uh, uh, taper width I, want, uh, I should use in order to get the coupling efficiency? Now what you do is actually you kind of uh, sweep the taper width size, this guy, and then you monitor how much power is, uh, you get at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of the waveguide as a function of the taper. And by doing this way, so I want to show you some result first. So actually, this is some result I did simulation, and later I did an experiment. So I, I found that actually, if I make my taper smaller and smaller, that actually, the simulation suggests to me that, OK, so this is a simulation, and that this is actually different mode, TE mode and TM mode. So TE mode is actually polarized horizontally. Uh, horizontally, so basically, it's so polarized in this way. This is TE mode. And TM mode is polarized in this way. So basically, the simulation tells me that first, uh, for both TE and TM mode, if I make the taper, which means this, this size, smaller and smaller, I will get a higher, higher coupling efficiency, right? And second, the simulation tells me that TE mode has a, be has a higher, better coupling than the TM mode, okay? And now I, I kind of fabricate my, my I didn't fabricate myself, my colleague fabricated this, but I can do it. And then I found actually, I do the experiment, and I found actually it's giving the same trend. So this is, uh, tells me, so basically the simulation actually agree with the, with the, uh, the experiment agree well with the simulation. So this is uh, what I said, so the, the very important thing of the simulation is actually, it helps you pre-evaluate the, the, the device performance before you really fabricate something, before you really cost, uh, waste the money and waste your time. So it helps you, it, it really helps you to save a lot of time and, 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 and the energy. And especially, uh, it it's, uh, agrees very well. So as you can see, if, uh, if I go to in this direction, I, I can really actually achieve something like 50% coupling efficiency. So this is a really decent value. So now, I'm going to the software and to show you actually how this, uh, this modeling is, uh, is, is working. So I, I assume that uh, all of you has installed the Lumrico already and, uh, and activate uh, your software yesterday. Right? 
Yes or no? Yes, Look. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so it just uh, open. So it just uh, so in the job in the Google Drive box, I put a kind of a template there, so you can just open it. Is everybody? Yeah. So this is just a template that uh, this how it works. You are free. You are free to to change any uh, change some parameters. Yeah. If you don't like the color, you can change the color. <laughs> or you don't like the name, you can change the name. So. So I guess uh, okay. So let me let me kind of uh, tell you uh, introduce this software to you step by step that how can you kind of model model this. Uh, this software. Okay. So, so the first is uh, when you do the when you do the uh, simulation, you first need to kind of build some kind of basic model. Okay. So the first model you need is actually the silica. So basically, what we are doing is actually kind of um, if you look at it here, this is actually the core the waveguide. Uh, here and this surrounding is actually uh, silicon dioxide. It's actually the cladding. So if you open this silica, which is the cladding, okay, then you see this is actually this black part. This part is actually this part is actually silica, and you can go to this guy, and you can actually change the geometry, basically the size of this module, and the material. So the material is the silicon dioxide. So the refractive index of silicon uh, 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 dioxide as a function of the frequency is really is actually uh, this, this information is the insert in, into the software itself. So you don't have to change anything. And uh, you can also rotate this uh, uh, structure. So basically you can model, you can actually model everything into your, in this software. Or if you have very complicated so, uh, uh, structure, you can you can kind of build this stuff in the SolidWorks or in GDS, and then you can input into the software. So you don't have to model everything here. But since our structure is very very simple, and uh, we can you can kind of um, kind of build uh, this uh, this model step by step here. Okay, the rest of this uh, graphic rendering. So it just means that you can change the color of this model. So this is your silicon dioxide. And then you put your, your 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 taper. So so it's actually the taper is actually as I show you, as I show you is actually it's a nano taper plus a kind of uh, bus wave guy with a constant width. Now the cool thing of uh, of uh, Loommaker is actually you can actually script your 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 structure. So actually in principle you can kind of model in any uh, arbitrarily uh, complicated uh, structure. So here is actually my 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 coding. So if you look at the, if maybe, maybe you can look at closely, if you find actually the, the width is actually expanding first, and then keep a constant. Yeah. So this is the bus wave, and then you can put some kind of uh, um, parameters here to kind of determine what kind of uh, or the, the, the property of, the, of this um, uh, module. So, for example, uh, the material I put here is actually silicon nitride near IR, and uh, and the taper width is actually uh, 100 nanometers, taper length 300 nanometer, uh, 300 micron, and uh, and the uh, waveguide width is actually the bus waveguide width at the at the end of the wave uh, waveguide. It's a, it's a two micron and uh, total length and uh, and the height. So basically, it's, it's a rectangle shape, and I can. You can actually play around with this parameter and to see how this model uh, is changing, corresponding to your to your inputs. Okay, this is actually the basic model now. Can you magnify your yeah, I can magnify. It depends on what you want to magnify. So, what you want to magnify? <laughs> okay, so you want to magnify this one or? <laughs> Or this one. No, like so the, uh, like this green. Like this, green. I mean, this one? No, this is a bit difficult because if I if I magnify this one, it's uh no, 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 the, the, the menu is 
This one? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, it, what? The lattice, ah, okay. I don't know actually. But I, see, yeah, I know, I know, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's too small, it's this one. It's kind of small, yes. But I assume that if you have the template, you can open it properly. <laughs> and you can see, see this information, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can. Yeah, it's a bit difficult, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Everyone yeah, have some idea? Go to the setting again, man? <laughs> the system prefer preference? Oh. Go to the system. 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 Go to the yeah, go to the uh, accessibility, like the blue, you the blue button with the person in the middle. Can you come? Come, come, come. Yeah. Yeah. Right next. Uh, right, right. Yeah. This one, accessibility. Yeah. 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 View you can get view get a shin view just to check the check the the model, yeah. But I think it's one point nine. Yeah. I'm a recorded right. <laughs> so now you should be able to push and uh, control and then mm -hmm. that's How to say? Control, 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 yeah. control and you can say. I see. And, and, uh, I see. Control? Yeah, it's uh, in that one, yes, exactly. That's a big problem, yeah. So what you need to do is actually the magic here is you make the graphic uh, rendering. So you open silicon dioxide and you open this uh, graphic and rendering and put the alpha is 0 0.2. Yeah. I think before it's 1, right? When you open it, it's 1. Now it's, you put 0 0.2 and you change the color. Everybody is following? No? <laughs> Sorry. How to how to zoom in? Press control. 
first come through? Yeah. And then two finger and zoom. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you see, this is a graphic. Uh, so then you can change the color. It's uh, it's not white and gray, but uh, black and uh, and the white. So. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. And then you go to the source. So this is actually your input source. Um, the story is uh, you can actually you can actually modeling. So you can have a, a butt coupling or grating coupler or or Lester fiber or anything. You can actually model the, the the input device. In our case, it's actually the Lester fiber is a bit difficult to to modeling because you need to know the precise geometry. But the, but the, all in all, this Lester fiber gives you a kind of uh, Gaussian mode. So I don't have to kind of modeling my Lester fiber. I just need to measure the size of a Gaussian mode. And then I, I can start my simulation. So this is, uh, this is some trick that I use in this modeling. So instead of uh, really kind of build uh, the fiber, for example, if you have a fiber uh, kind of coupled to a grating coupler, you really have to kind of model the fiber and the grating coupler. But here I have a Lester fiber. I have, uh, I have uh, I measured the Gaussian mode. I just uh, assume that I kind of launch a, a Gaussian mode Whatever device I use, I just have a Gaussian mode, and I kind of couple into the rest, uh, into my, my waveguide. So here, actually, you can configure your Gaussian mode, so you can actually kind of give some kind of uh, amplitude. And this phase is actually tells you either it's uh, it's polarized horizontally, or kind of vertically. It determines that actually you want to excite T mode or T L mode inside your. Yeah. Okay. You're right. Oops. So Gaussian board, yeah. Okay, and then the injection is actually basically I, I can determine how this mode is uh, injected uh, either in the x direction or in the in the in the in the in y direction, and also I can actually orientate my my my, my source such that it's probably injected in this way or whatever. So you have uh, you can actually this is geometry properties. Okay, then you can actually kind of uh, set your set your your geometry. So basically, if you have a Gaussian mode, well, the Gaussian mode is actually kind of really uh, infinity size because the tail actually uh, extend to infinity. But as long as your kind of uh, your, your 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 this window for your source is large than the the radius of your Gaussian beam, much larger than the radius of a Gaussian beam, it is a good approximation. So, for example, the Gaussian mode that I put here is uh, have a 2.85 micron radius, which, which I will show later. So actually, a window of 10 by 10 is good enough. And then you can put the frequency here, OK? So the good thing of FTD is actually you can either put a single frequency here or can put a broadband. So here, you can actually say, uh, I, can, I want to start a frequency at the 1.55 or stop at the 1.55. So basically, I want to kind of have a some kind of uh, uh, envelope like this. Uh, so, because actually it's, it's a real time, it's, it's always gives you a pulse. So even though you put 1.55, you still see kind of uh, this kind of envelope, like this. But it's okay. It's not a it's not it's not a big issue. And uh, you can even put it uh, like say I can even put it uh, like two or one. Then you can see actually the the the, the envelope is really kind of uh, changing corresponding to your to your input. But in this case, it's not correct. So you actually, because for one to two is actually a, a kind of photosecond uh, uh, pulse. So you really have to kind of optimize for short pulse. Then this is actually kind of the correct the shape. But if you 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 don't you, you're not having a, a short pulse, then you probably just uh, centered around the one point five five. Then actually, the 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 spectral envelope looks like this. Yes. Well, in principle, in principle, it should be Fourier, right? By the Fourier um, spectrum, right? Limited. This is not really Gaussian, right? This doesn't. This is, this is not a Gaussian, right? Yeah, it isn't. This is not Gaussian. 
this is uh, well. Actually, I cannot give you more information actually about this shape. But the case is, uh, but the case is, even though I think actually it depends on the shape. Actually, uh, kind of, uh, if you have a certain shape, it's probably sometimes uh, help you to solve this problem easily. But what in the end, what you care about is actually you really compare the the spectrum component. So if I if I it does so what. You, um, what you get in the end is actually your, your output normalized to the input. So if you are, let's say, if I consider kind of frequency uh, component here, here then which means that the output is still kind of reduced correspondingly. Yeah, exactly. So that's why, you know, you get a coefficient is still the same. But it's, a, yeah. I think actually the, the, the actually the general uh, the, the envelope is actually really determined by the by the software itself. So maybe that's kind of uh, optimi uh, optimized optimized uh, uh, algorithm to, to solve it. Yeah. So this is how it works. So I, I put it back. Okay. And then you have the bin options. So basically, you can tell that uh, the how you can configure this kind of uh, free space source. Now in this case, actually, I, I said this is a Gaussian bin. So if you give a Gaussian bin, so basically you, you give the, the bin position and the, the size of the of the waist, uh, then basically you, you kind of uh, uniquely define the, this Gaussian bin. And actually, the radius of 2.85 is some kind of uh, radius that I measured I, I measured in, in, in my experimentally. And that gives you the divergence, OK? So that's all. OK. And then you go to the most important part, which is actually the FDTDs uh, uh, module. So before you do this FDTD, uh, so when you put the FDTD zone, yeah. Did you set up the port on the other side? Yeah, I set the FDTD first and later, later the, the port, yeah. So um, now it's actually the FDD zone. So basically, this is the FDTD. And actually, you first have to to to, to kind of tell um, what is the the size of the the, the simulation zone you have, and uh, so this is determined by the geometry. <coughs> yes, yeah. Okay, the geometry. And general is actually okay. This is a three D. I want to do a three D simulation. Background index one is actually it means that the everything, everything outside this zone is uh, is uh, is air. Okay. Uh, no, it means actually if you no sorry, <laughs> background index one means actually if you didn't uh, so everything inside, everything inside this software. For example, here, here I didn't define anything, right? But it, this is this part is inside the the FDD zone, and they're actually assigned to one. So basically, th this tells you this is the air. And then the simulation time. So actually, again, this simulation time. Oh, I maybe I should zoom in a little bit. The simulation time here is also important. So basically, the simulation time. So I, as I mentioned, that actually your simulations uh, terminate based on either the simulation time passed or the system reach a stable situation. And actually, the the variation from 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 time step to time step is below a certain threshold. So. If you want to get a stable uh, simulation, that's a stable field distribution in your in your simula simulation zone, then this simulation time should be should be set uh, much long longer than uh, than sh 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 you should set a big value here, such that the, the first the system first reach a stable state, and up and this uh, this time is, uh, is is less than the the time that you set here, okay. And then the meshing. So basically, it's, uh, it just tell you how you mesh the structures. There's the mesh accuracy. So basically, you can set from one, two, three, four up to, to eight. There are certain algorithm uh, based on this mesh. So, so the mesh accuracy is basically determined is determined by the wavelengths you simulate. If you let's say if you now I'm actually kind of simulate the 1.55. So in this wavelength and the mesh accuracy is 1.55 divided by six. I think the in, in accuracy one is actually divided by six. Okay. If you measure, if you simulate something from one micro to two micro, then this ma this mesh accuracy, the the the, si the size of your mesh cell cell, is not determined by the two micro. 
but determined by the one micro. So it's always determined by the shortest wavelength in your, in your light source. This is something that you need to be, be careful. Uh, be careful, yeah. And usually when you start the simulation, you start with the, the low mesh accuracy. So you, the first step, first thing you want to check is whether your model is valid. It doesn't give you any error. So you should uh, start with one. and takes you kind of for a few minutes to solve this problem. And then you increase the mesh accuracy from step by step uh, until kind of eight. I think the maximum here is eight. Then you kind of see if your value kind of converge to some value. This is similar to the self-adapting uh, meshing in the ANSYS and the, the console, but you have to do it here manually instead of automatically. Okay, and, uh, and there's kind of, uh, yeah, and, uh, okay, and then you have the boundary condition. So if you have a um, uh, kind of uh, meshing like this, okay, you can set your boundary condition. Now usually, would you know that if we want to have a kind of a free propagating uh, field in the, into the space, you, you put the PML. Okay, about how to set into PML is actually a good question because it, it, there's tons of paper about how to do this. So usually what you do is actually you put the PML boundary condition and use this kind of a standard uh, PML layer for this. However, there's a kind of a trick here. So if you kind of simulate some structure, which, uh, which have this, uh, this kind of, uh, I put, so if you have a kind of structure, have this kind of uh, uh, rectangle shape, okay, and you want to simulate the, the polarization in this direction, and you will find actually this half and this half, they are exactly the same, right, because the, all the field distribution should be the same because they are symmetric with respect to this one. And uh, therefore, if I only simulate this part, and I just uh, replicate, put it here, I should get exactly the same result. But, uh, but the benefit here is actually, I only simulate the half of the volume of the model. So I save half of the time, right? And if you look at the, if you, you look at again, still it's polarized in this direction, and look at this axis. So let's say if I feel the polarized in this, in this way, the field polarized here should be polarized in this way, right? So with respect to this uh, symmetric axis, uh, it's anti-symmetric, right? So which means if I want to uh, kind of simulate the, the light propagating in this way, what I need to do is actually just to simulate only one-fourth of the structure. And the, I set this boundary condition as anti-symmetric and this boundary condition as symmetric. And this is what you see with the template that I set it already for you. That you see actually uh, there's a kind of uh, y-axis is actually um, is, uh, symmetric and uh, z-axis, uh, I think it's z, right? z is uh, symmetric and the y is uh, anti-symmetric. And you put it here, and the benefit here is actually you only simulate one-fourth of your simulation zone and you will get the same, exactly the same result. It saves you a lot of time. So making you full use of the, the symmetric property of your model, is, it can, you, you can get a lot of benefit. Because most of the time when you run simulation, you're either running off of the CPU source or you're running off the memory. And your memory is actually, the, the required memory is determined by, by the simulation volume. So if you, if you can play uh, well with the symmetric, uh, uh, this trick of uh, symmetric uh, volume, then you, you, you kind of uh, save some CPU and save some, some memory. This is some trick uh, that I can show you. And also, uh, depend, on, depend on what kind of this is, on, uh, depend on, um, depend on the, 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 the simulation, if you have a really kind of broadband source that you have to use stabilized uh, boundary condition instead of the standard. And this stabilized uh, boundary condition is actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's thicker, which is actually la uh, larger, so it uh, costs you more simulation time, but uh, uh, simultaneously it reduces the numerical dispersion. So if you have a broadband source, you, you have to use a stabilized boundary condition. But this is some kind of advanced uh, kind of uh, um, tricks uh, that you can actually, there's a lot of uh, well documentation and the Lumaker software that you can actually uh, find this uh, user manual and you know how to set up the, the, the structure easily. And the advanced options, usually I don't change anything. Okay? 
So now we have go to the uh, kind of now we have the input mode. So this is source, and uh, actually I want to see how much how much mode is actually. Uh, oops. So how much uh, power is coupled into the into the waveguide? So actually I put another monitor here. This is what called a monitor out. So basically it just tells you the normalized the, the power transmitted. So it, which is the the coupling efficiency here. You don't have to take change anything. You probably just need to change the uh, structure, the size, and uh, the other stuff is more or less the same. And the what is also kind of useful. Yeah. Is. yeah. So is it going to calculate the modes? How much power is in each mode? Total, this how much power hits this wall. This is actually the order mode. What? So this is all the mode, all the power there. So it doesn't calculate like how much. It's power not. Uh, it's it's not the S matrix. S matrix is the mode to mode. This is not the mode to mode. But then if you want to calculate the, the input output coupling of wave, where you're interested how much goes into one particular mode. Right? Exactly, and this is uh, what I'm going to show now. So, so basically what you do is actually, so the mode, how you cal calculate, the, the way you calculate the, how much mode in the fundamental mode is actually, you have first to record the, 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 the sub mode, the, to the total mode. And then you project this mode to the fundamental mode. So you have to calculate the fundamental mode, and you have to calculate the, 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 the final mode, and then do the integral. So, so the first mode, the, the total transmitted mode, is actually recorded by this monitor. And the, the second monitor, which we call the, uh, yeah, actually, I didn't put it here, because I know it's going to be very fundamental, because of adiabatic operation. But you can put it here. You can put it here as a, a mode expansion function. Okay, let's do it. This is a good actually, good lecture. So I put it x normal. I put it uh, three zero five. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I put it like this. So it's actually some somewhere here. Oh, but doesn't matter actually, because I actually calculate the icon mode as long as the cross section is the same. It's not going to make any difference, but so let's put them together. So now I have an eigen mode. So basically, you go here, the monitor, and you take the mode expansion. And this mode expansion is actually going to tell you the eigen mode at the different position of your model. So this is actually very similar to the the, the algorithm with this mo with this function is a purely FEM. So you just calculate the eigen mode, like uh, people do ANSYS and uh, as, uh, uh, or, or COMSOL. So basically, you, you t take this one and you put your you overlap this mode with uh, with the with the uh, this monitor out. Okay, delete. And in this mode, you can actually monitor. You can actually put the mode expansion. So you can actually determine. Uh, you can actually decide what what kind of mode you are interested. How you want to project. So let's say I want to user select. So I can select my mode. Okay. This is the structure, OK? And uh, I only care about the uh, fundamental mode, so I just calculate the mode, OK? Mm -hmm. And then I can have this TE mode, OK? This is TM mode, and this higher order mode. So then you can actually, based on which mode you, you, you kind of take, then actually you can you can say how much power is trans transmitted, uh, it's coupled into the Fundamental mode or higher order mode. The, the software does calculate that. You have to calculate manually later. No, you have to calculate. Uh, no, software will calculate the uh, automatically. Okay. So, so basically, for example, I take this TE mode, fundamental TE mode, okay, and said okay, and then you kind of add a monitor. So basically, you say I calculate this mode, and I want to calculate how much this mode is contained by by another monitor, which I which I uh, well, I got. So now I want to compare the other mode, which is. Uh, I put it here, oh, yeah. So monitor out, okay. And then later, if I read this monitor, I will know that how much power is uh, is coupled into the fundamental TE mode instead of the total coupled uh, power. So you can really kind of uh, analyze mode by mode, okay. So I it's so so okay, and. Uh, and then you can also put a kind of a mode profile like this one. So basically, you can monitor actually the 
the full mode propagation in this way. So more or less, you kind of uh, yeah. I have I have this mode actually. <laughs> I have this one. Okay, T. This is the T zero zero is actually the T fundamental mode. Okay, and then it's okay, and uh, you can check, but usually it's, it's okay. This kind of simulation time and the memory, and then you can run. Okay, so run the first step is actually the meshing, meshing the structure. Oh, I cannot, yeah. So it's meshing, okay? So basically just kind of mesh this uh, structure into a small cell, okay? It takes 10 minutes, but it's okay. I have, I have a data saved, so let's wait. It's a very good computer, so now it's running. So basically start to launch a mode and start to calculate the propagating of the mode. Well, you can even put a kind of monitor to, to see how the mode is propagated with a with kind of movie style. It just kind of show the mode propagation profile at each time step. Okay, I'll see 35, 64 minutes. If this is 34, you probably run it probably 10 minutes because this for 34 minutes because actually I cancel, I remove all the symmetry boundary condition. That's why it's 10 minutes become 34. It's kind of uh, I kind of uh, uh, four times the, the, the simulation time. Okay, so I'm not going to wait for half an hour. So I'm going to show the result. That's how you kind of uh, in interpret your result. Okay. Oops. Oh, my computer start to make some noise. Okay, so I'm going to close this one. Okay, and this is actually, oh no. Looks like I lost the data. <laughs> okay, we have to wait a little bit. Oh no, I think actually I saved the stuff. I think I saved the stuff. Voila, this is, yeah, this is actually what I want to show. So basically, this is uh, after, this is the result. Now you see, actually, it's, uh, you, you cannot change anything. It's, it, you edit that basically it doesn't change anything because actually now the data is saved. So what you need to do is actually you, via, you, you, you select the full, this uh, full profile, and you say visualize e-field, okay? And now you see actually how the, the light is coupled. Maybe I should put it here. You see, actually, you see the pixel here because actually your mesh is very low, so that's why you see kind of this pixel. But what you can well see is actually the light is well coupled here. Now you see, actually, you ha you can see actually there's kind of this this part looks kind of uh, kind of uh, shiny. Let me check if I can put a plot in the in the logarithm scale. Yeah. So you start with a Gaussian wave uh, at the front, and then it basically propagates through the waveguide. Yeah. A part of it will go through the waveguide, a part of it doesn't, it just propagates through the free space. Exactly, and this is this part. You see this, uh, this field? This is actually not guided. So, well, how many microns does it take for it to complete it like that? I mean, it's not a collimated light, but it's still it would. Yeah, the case is uh, usually, well, if you have a Gaussian mean, let's say, uh, you have few microns really length, right? Yeah. So basically what you have is, uh, first you have a radiation light, which is not guided at all. 
and actually it kind of goes all go, go, uh, goes all way. This is you have an instant loss at the beginning, and then you have a light that actually propagates into the into the resonator and the, uh, into the wave guy, and there's a weakly uh, propagating the uh, light in the cladding. Gaussian go away? No, it's even longer. How long is it? Depends on the mode, actually. It never goes away. I mean, it just expands to a sphere, a half a sphere, right? Well, it depends on how you define go away, right? In my opinion, it's not guided in the wave resonator. <laughs> it's not guided in the waveguide, it's just go away because you're not going to see it in the, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the other side of okay. the chip. So let me just rephrase my question. If you haven't had the waveguide, yeah. You will still see something at your monitor. No, you're not going to see. After after hundreds of micron, you not see anything, or you see very weak signal. Okay, so that's one question. How many micron does it take to for this background to go away? Like, to hundred micron. Well, it depends on depends on the if you have a kind of a large a small a large mode size. Then basically this light is collimated, so the really length is longer. Now actually this takes a, a longer distance. If you all have a tightly focused beam, then the really length is shorter. Then actually I kind of kind of di diverge quickly. So for two micron, two point eight five micron. It takes hundred micron. I would say it take hundred micron. Depends on uh, it is uh, um, dissipated to a certain degree. Let's say. So how do you should do that? You just to change the length of the waveguide and see whether the result is the Exactly, yeah. You, so you, exactly, this is more or less how it works. And actually, I know that for this software, if you have a very fine uh, meshing, the maximum, the, be the best resolution that you can get is 10 to the minus 6. Okay. So anything below 10 to the minus 6, I, I should not be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can we visualize it in time? In time, yes. There's a kind of monitor called the... Uh, called the Called, uh, I think there's a kind of monitor called, uh, yeah, if you put the movie, so you put the movie and then you can, you can see in time, but, I, but actually you have to put this monitor at the beginning. So, I'm sorry, where is this the movie option? So it's, you go to monitor and there's a movie. But uh, you, have to, you have to set this monitor in the model at the very beginning before you run. Now I cannot put it, uh, set it back. Why in my, and uh, to me it's actually not very useful. This uh, because you just see how it propagates. It's, uh, what what in the end what you want to see is actually you just look at the final mode propagation profile. You, you know more or less whether your model is uh, correct or not. Yeah. So. Okay. And then you can actually see the. Um, kind of uh, uh, total uh, couple of the power. So you go to the monitor out, and you visualize to the T, which is the transmission, OK? You go to the T, and you see, actually, in this case, I got uh, something like 80%, more than 80%. So which means this, uh, coupling, this coupler is very efficient. Let's say 80% profess it, let's say. And then you can also kind of uh, uh, calculate how much power is inside the inside the TE fundamental mode. So you go to TE zero zero, and you visualize expansion four. And then you just uh, remove all the kind of uh, not very useful parts. So you can backward. So you can see you can see here. So you can see here, this is actually my total cup of the power, which is something like 80.6%. Uh, and this is actually the power inside the fundamental mode, which is 80.2%, which means that actually these tapers really work very well in the, in the single mode in operation. It's the adiabatic operation it, it works very well. So this is how, how you can kind of uh, uh, estimate uh, how much power is actually coupled into the target uh, mode family. So that's all. So this is uh, how it works. So, well, in the exercise, you can actually play around with this uh, uh, 
template they send you and change the parameter and to change and, and to check if you can if you if you make something different I would say yeah okay now we go to the go to the back to the slide again okay and then actually I compare two different cases actually the the bad coupling and the good coupling so in the in the so this is actually put in the in the logarithm scale okay so in the bad coupling case you can see actually because of the, this is actually, I think it's the 500 uh, nanometers taper. So which is, this is 100 nanometers taper. So you can see actually if your mode uh, match is bad at the, at the entrance of the taper, then you see you have a quick uh, light power loss here. And then you only couple the very small power inside the resonator. And here you see actually this kind of uh, interference pattern. This is actually due to the light propagate inside the core and inside the cladding, they have different phase velocity. That's why you get this interference pattern. Now in a good coupling, you see actually you have a little bit uh, loss here, and then later most of the power is actually co uh, it's, uh, confined inside the resonator. So again, this is uh, uh, very important that when you do the simulation, you get the result, you have to think about whether this result makes some physics meaning, whether, whether this result makes some sense. This interference is actually the cladding mode. There's actually, there's a, depend on the angle. So there's a, for this large angle light, they just dissipate quickly. There's also kind of weak power, which is propagated inside the cladding. No, no, I mean the interference, like there's a standing wave in the wave. Yeah, but this is because the cladding, the, cladding, uh, the light propagates into the cladding and the light propagates into the core. They have different uh, interference. Uh -huh. That's why you get kind of this, uh, this uh, you only see this strong interference at the edge. No, it's at the in the center of the, it's uh, more or less the same. But, which is pretty sure it's not the back fraction. Oh, I think this is your question. Yeah. This is the, not the back fraction because you can tell back. So first of all, PML condition works very well if you have a normal incident. This is uh, like uh, the radiation boundary condition in ANSYS. So usually if you have a kind of light pro uh, propagated normally to your boundary and with a PML setting, usually there should be no pop uh, reflection. And what's more, in the, sim in the software, you can actually see the backward uh, uh, light propagate because sim uh, the power is actually calculated by the pointing vector. So you can easily distinguish uh, the forward propagating mode and the backward propagating mode. So I'm pretty sure that in this case, I have very weak uh, propagating mode. So that's why you have this kind of interference. This interference pattern, I think is, uh, I believe is actually due to the, the cladding because it, it's easy, it's, it's very easy to see because in the bad coupling, you have a stronger interference pattern. In a good coupling, you don't have this. You have a wee really weak. Right? This just means that your light is guided very well in the in the uh, waveguide. And your boundary condition is. It's all PML. Okay. It's all PML. Okay. Yeah. How big is the air? box? Sir? How big is the air box around it? The air box. Uh, the the cladding. The cladding is uh, a ten micron times ten micron. Yeah. yeah. Should be yeah, ten micron times ten micron. Okay, mm -hmm. so which means uh, yeah, so you have to kind of interpret your results um, such that you know whether your simulation gives kind of uh, good. What is the maximum uh, transmission bit for simulation? For maximum, it can be I don't know. The, the well, probably I don't care about how much transmission I get from simulation, but how much transmission I get from experiment, right? So the the. So in principle, you can get 90% with simulation. With the width of, width of uh, what well, depends on the shape of your, so with the width of uh, less than 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers, you can get 95% of uh, transmission. But uh, you never get it with your experiment, yes. If we launch the very short pulse inside the waveguide, inside the paper and first place, why is the whole structure illuminated at the same time? So if, if I have a short pulse, yes. And the, uh, what's, so what's the ne uh, other, uh, next part? If we have a short pulse in time, then it should also be uh, short in space, right? Only part of the wave should be illuminated time. No, actually, this is the power. So it doesn't depend on the frequency component. So, actually, kind of related yeah. to what is this plot exactly? This is actually the power, the E field, the E square yeah. intensity. Power, but 
intensity, yeah. Or what? Because it's a transient thing. That no, this is not transient. This is a stable thing. Because I, I, as I mentioned that your simulation terminated with two conditions, either your simulation time passed or your, 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 your kind of model reached a stable state. So this is not transient. Okay, so, so you excite this thing with a step function, not delta function. What do you mean step function or delta function? Like, you know, you basically turn on the uh, power and then you leave it on. I, I leave it on, yes. Okay. I think you get the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> and then it's a summary, so basically the talk is over. So what you should uh, learn kind of take home message is actually you should know that, that what's the difference between FDTD and FEM when to use which one. And second, you should know how to actually, how this coupling efficiency is a function of the mode mismatch. And uh, yeah, and also this exercise probably, you can actually kind of play with. Yeah. That's all? Yeah. Hey guys, so we're gonna take a break.